town of Newcastle, Western County Limerick is gearing up for the annual Eggshea Michael Hartnett Literary and Arts Weekend. This year, in association with Limerick County Council Arts Office, the Limerick Writers' Centre is publishing an anthology of work written in tribute to Michael Hartnett called I Live in Michael Hartnett. Michael Hartnett died in 1999 and is laid to rest in the local cemetery. His gravestone contains a carving of the emblem he is closely associated with, the necklace of wrens. A crowd of over 100 people gathered at the Red Door Gallery for the launch on Saturday the 27th of April 2013. Good afternoon ladies, I see that got you. Michael the sound man said you'll have to shout just for the first bit so I'll stop shouting now that you've all stopped. You're all very welcome here this afternoon and it's wonderful to see such a large turnout for this event on such a wonderful sunny day in Newcastle West. On behalf of Limerick County Council and the extra Michael Hartnett, I'd like to welcome you all here this, this afternoon for the launch of this wonderful anthology which celebrates the work and the life of Michael Hartnett. It contains the work of 71 poets, um, which is, I think rarely has a poet been so written about and celebrated in the work of other poets. Uh, and as Joan McKernan said in her foreword, there have been other books already dedicated to Michael Hartnett. This is the first in the sense that it's the first one which is totally an anthology of poetry. Um, I don't think it'll be the last. Uh, but but this, this is a, a wonderful celebration of Michael Hartnett, the poet and the man. We can't let the afternoon pass without mentioning Joan McKernan, our arts officer here and organiser and founder of H. Michael Hartnett. <clears throat> she, this anthology was very important to her. Uh, her heart was in this, as it was with Revival Press, the publishers, and with James Lawler, the editor. Joan saw it from the beginning because we talked about it all of us many times. And, and she saw it in the, this anthology as being exactly in line with her own ethos behind Michael, H. Michael Hartnett, which was the whole idea of celebrating Michael Hartnett, but also building from his legacy as a poet and using that legacy to enrich and, and to continue and to, and to celebrate equally the work of contemporary writers and, and poetry always and all art forms build on the past. The past is always our foundation. Not that I'm saying Michael Hartnett is in the past because he's very much present uh, in his work and in the, the wonderful title of this, this very positive title, which of course is taken from Paul Meehan's, Meehan's poem, Hagiography. Uh, I just love the title of that, that sense that I live in Michael Hartnett. And Joan loved that idea of the continuation and the living spirit of Hartnett, but also the living, continuing spirit of poetry. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce you first of all to Dominic Taylor, who is Editor-in-Chief at Revival Press in Limerick City. So please welcome Dominic Taylor. Thanks Eileen, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I think it was the American uh, comedian George Burns who said that the secret of a good speech is to have a good beginning and a good ending and to keep them two very close together. So, so that's what I'm going to be doing. No, but uh, I said I'd like to welcome you all here today. And uh, I won't say anything about the collection because I'll leave that to James and to Paula later on. Right? But what I would like to do, uh, again, like as Eileen said, uh, I really have to thank Joan McKernan for, for this. It just would not have happened without her. And also uh, James Lawler, who, uh, you know, without his tireless effort, it, it wouldn't have happened either. He'd probably never work with me again, but it's done now. We've done it, you know. So uh, a few other people, like Jason Cook, who did a fantastic job on the cover, uh, Jim Burke of Kelly Richards Printing, 
and um, my own colleagues from the Limerick Writer Centre, which uh, Revival Press is an imprint of the Limerick Writer Centre. Um, Tanya and um, Marion down there, and Tom Downey over there, and Jerry Siney over here. I really, the support of them are critical to the success of the Limerick Writer Centre. And uh, of course, I want to thank Paula for coming down, and I want to thank uh, Richard, uh, Richard Nash, uh, who kindly gave us the, the refreshments. So I think that's really the bulk of the people I need to thank, and I leave the rest to, to the other people. So I'll hand you back to Eileen, and she'll take you through the rest of the program. Thank you. I'm going to follow down next lead, and the next person I'd like you to, to talk to. I, I'm not sure people, uh, editors are up and um, you know they get the, the sharp end of the stick in lots of ways, I think. Um, as a writer myself, you know, they get all the blame for a lot of things, and sometimes they don't get the credit, and sometimes people don't realise the sheer number of hours uh, and hard work and like close attention to detail that goes into the editing of an anthology. And imagine, you know, it's hard to deal with one poet, but try dealing with 71 of them at the same time. Anyone who can pull that off has something special going on for him. And I think when you'll hear him speak, uh, that you'll realise uh, what I mean when I say that in James Lawler we have a very special person in Newcastle West. It's, it's wonderful for, for us at uh, Aiksha, uh, but I think for the town and for everybody, that a local young man has such an interest, which has been a long-term interest in the work of Hartnett. And again, we, that's what we need, isn't it? We need that continuance, uh, and that comes from our, our younger generation. Um, as Leo Barak would say, being a woman of a certain age myself, <laughs> um, I always appreciate the the efforts and the sheer passion that drives this young man. Not only as the editor of this book, but also uh, he's, he's a passion for punishment because he's, he's also on the H. Michael Hartnett committee here for quite a number of years and is a very hard-working member of our committee. So please welcome James Lawler. <laughs> gentlemen and Corhir Lock. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Paula Meehan for agreeing to launch uh, I Live in Michael Hartness. Uh, the title of the anthology, as Eileen said, is taken from Paula's home, Hagiography. I'm delighted to welcome you here. I've been a fan of your, of your work for, for many years. Um, I would like to thank all the contributors. Uh, many of you are here today also. And Joe McKiernan, of course, for getting on board with the book and providing advice and encouragement. <coughs> Uh, Dominic Taylor of Revival Press for publishing the book, and a special word of thanks for Vicky Nash for all our help and all the Aisha committee. Um, I would like to thank everyone for showing up here today. I see lots of familiar faces, and I really appreciate you coming here. I am delighted that this book is being launched at Aisha Michael Hartnett. Um, at the opening of the festival last Thursday, Noel Curran, Director General of RTE, started his speech with a quote from a Michael Hartnett poem There will be talking of lovely things. This set the tone for the festival, and it sums up nicely everything that Aisha Michael Hartnett is and continues to be. In the last few days, many people have asked me where my interest in Michael Hartnett started. And I suppose it's a question that I can't fully answer. Uh, growing up here in West Limerick, I would often hear people talk about the poet Hartnett. I guess I had this childlike curiosity. Who was this man with the title? After Michael Hartnett died in 1999, I remember reading some of his work and seeing the documentary. I was in first year shooting at Desmond College in Newcastle West, but it wasn't until I got to university that I went looking and discovered all of his collections dating back to the 1960s. I could identify with the words that he wrote and in particular the people he wrote about. My degree was in New Media and English Literature, and as part of this you had to read books from all periods and all places of the world, but I kept returning to Michael Hartnett. Besides from sharing a similar West Limerick background, which did help in the beginning, there was something that's in his writing that struck a chord with me. He is a writer that speaks about a place and an Ireland that I could identify with. His work is edgy and at times unpredictable. He certainly didn't hold back. The more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And in many ways, I'm still curious about him. 
Um, despite what appeared on my name in RT News this week, I don't claim to be a Hartnett scholar. <laughs> or anything of the like. I do, however, think, like a lot of people, there is huge value in his work. At the library the other day, when we friends of Michael Hartnett, John Cusson and Gabriel Fitzmaurice who were being interviewed, the one thing they could agree on was that he was a genius and his poetry is timeless. And I think these are two hugely significant things to agree on, if nothing else. I think the story of his childhood is very interesting, and it's one that I could identify with myself. Uh, like a lot of people, uh, myself included, uh, Michael lived with his grandmother for a subst substantial period as a child. His grandmother, Bridget O'Halpine, was a widow from North Kerry, living in Camas, a townland a few miles from the Castle West. Michael would lie awake in the loft, listening to his grandmother and her neighbours singing, playing cards and conversing in Irish. This had a profound effect on him. He saw an Ireland that was declining. It was dying in front of his eyes. Poems such, poems such as Death of an Irish Woman illustrate a reality that happened. Beyond the sadness of its inevitable decline, there was a sense of wonder though. And in a poem he wrote in 1968, simply entitled Sonnet No. 9, he wrote, I saw magic on a green road. And I believe he did, not in a conventional way, but in an inherent sense. There was a culture that was superstitious. It was built on the way they spoke and interacted with each other. And to the young Michael Hartnett, it was magical. In many ways, and in a lot of, work, he, and in a lot of his work, he tries to return to his childhood vision of the world. It was a world that was shady, sometimes violent, but yet full of colour, mystery, mystery, and of course, culturally rich. One of the ways he tried to return to this place was language. He tried in a variety of ways, but the most obvious was his abandoning of the English language. In her poem, Misha Era, Ivan Bolin writes that a new language is a kind of scar and heals after a while into a passable imitation of what went before. Hartner tried to delve into this wound and try to reopen it. He wasn't interested in a passable imitation. He had seen this island in his grandmother's small farm. He wanted to return to it. But it was an impossible task. The change of Ireland, yeah, the change in Ireland in the last few decades of the 20th century was rapid. No matter who you were or what you did, you couldn't stop the changes. And I think in his later poems you can see there's an acceptance that this was happening, that he couldn't change it no matter what he did. It is an honour for me to have undertaken this project. The real tribute, I suppose, and always will be, that Mike Hartnett is continued to be read. But second only to this is to be remembered by your peers and those that follow you. And I think this, this book, it is, uh, it, it's, it's one of those greatest tributes that your peers or someone in your same profession could write about you or some, respect you in that way. I Live in Michael Hartnett is a great tribute to him. It contains the work of over 70 poets. I just learned 71, I didn't count them. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the great literary figures of Ireland are included. In the introduction, I said I wanted to reclaim Michael Hartnett, and I suppose a better word to use would have been reassess. I wanted to gather back all the pieces of work from by his peers and put together a tribute in his own medium of poetry. I thought it was time to reassess and try to make sense of his sizable legacy. By gathering together, you can also compare. I came to the conclusion that Michael has become his own space. You see, writers, musicians are using him because he speaks to us now in this present time very clearly. Perhaps it is Michael's focus on transitions, of times changing rapidly, and his obsession with preserving the past that makes Michael Hartnett appeal to, appeal to people now post Celtic Tiger. Ireland. Then again, <laughs> then again, all life is in transition, and this is perhaps what makes Michael Hartnett timeless. This project began um, when it was, it was to mark Michael's 70th year, but that was in 2011. So it has kind of uh, went on a bit longer than, than we thought. Um, but some other milestones kind of occurred along the way. Um, this past September marked 50 years since Michael Hartnett left Newcastle West uh, as a young man. He was age 20. After a brief spell in London, he came home and worked as a postman in Newcastle West. He had received some publicity while he was in London, and three of his poems were accepted to be published in Poetry Ireland. Perhaps because of this, he received a letter out of the blue from Professor John Jordan of UCD, offering him a scholarship in University College Dublin, 
And like now, these things just didn't happen. You know, it was very, very unusual. So, on the 13th of September, um, 1962, he left his life as a postman. It was a life he described as hell in, in a letter to, to the professor. So he left, began his new life in Dublin. So I discovered it by accident as I was putting the first finishing touches to the book in September. So I was in the same place but 50 years apart uh, from, from Michael and I couldn't help but think what would a, have a 20 year old Michael Hartman make of it if he knew that 50 years later a book of poems dedicated to him from the poets of Ireland would be in the process, be, be in the process of being written to be launched at a festival named after him in a building beside a statue of him. I wonder what he would make of it all. <laughs> I will finish now by reading one of my favourite poems by Michael Hartnett, The Person as a Dreamer, We Talk About the Future. So, The Person as a Dreamer, We Talk About the Future, for Des Healy. It has to be a hill, high of course, and twilight. There have to be some birds, all sadly audible, a necessary haze, and small wristlets of rain, yes, and a tremendous air of satisfaction. Both of us will be old, and both our wives, of course, have died young and tragic, and all our children have gone their far ways estranged, or else not forgotten. We have been through a war, been hungry and heroes, and here we are now, calm, fed, and reminiscent. The hills are old, silent, our pipe smoke rises up. We have come a long way. Thank you, James. Our next speaker is going to be Paula Meehan, and Paula is officially uh, launching the book for us here today, and we're, we're absolutely thrilled at the extra that she was able and, and uh, we knew she'd be willing, but we're delighted she was able to be here. Uh, Paula was here for the very first day extra as well, and many times since. Um, so I, I don't think she needs any introduction. We all know who Paula Meehan is and the value of her own work and the, and the beauty of her own work. And I, I think she, I can say on her behalf that she's here today in both capacities as a poet herself but also as someone who was a close friend of Michael Hartnett. Um, and that's what we love in Newcastle West, is that wonderful blend of um, poetry and love and friendship. Um, and I was reading last night, I, I, um, I shouldn't be admitting, I, I went into the Courtney Lodge at about half past two last night, by the side door, after being in town having chips, as you do. <laughs> And I was sitting there, all on my own actually, uh, reading, one of the, all over the town we have, there's poems of Michael Hartnett up there, and the one that, that, that I was sitting beside last night was the poet is master craftsman. And I thought, you know, that's so perfect for today and for this anthology. Uh, and it, the, the opening line of that is that, eras do not end when great poets die. And today, and this anthology is living proof of that, that because the craft continues. I think that was the whole point of the poem. And nobody carries that craft forward more beautifully than our next guest. So please welcome Paula Meehan. behind the podium. <laughs> I should have brought a ladder. Um, thanks for the beautiful introduction. It really makes me feel at home. And no no matter what um, no matter what's what's said, you know James, you are considered a great scholar of yeah. And you just have to uh, accept the mantle and live with it. <laughs> but it is beautiful and it's a privilege to hear the poetry in the voice of the next generation. 
Um, I wrote out what I'm going to say because my memory, I think, has been is in Nama. <laughs> Once I had a memory. Um, now, I am here to honour the book, and it's a book made with care and craft and commitment, a book I believe would have astounded the poet Hartnett, astounded him with our love of him, our loss of him, our deep desire to remember him, to make him live again. I'm very conscious that I stand in his home place before his family and community who really do live in Michael Hartnett to express our gratitude for the life of a great poet and a beloved man. 13 years after his death, it's nearly 14, isn't it? Yeah, yeah in, in October. After his death, he grows more alive in our imaginations, more anecdote accretes about him, some of it even true. <laughs> Tall tales, wonder tales, rumours and shaggy dog stories, they grow taller, shaggier by the year. The universities are discovering him, God help us. Um, his name is on the lips of a new generation of poets, poets who were only children when he died, and I know some of them are here today. Even the scrap merchants are eyeing him up and they have designs on him. And I, I know. He would have had a great night's fun and extempore storytelling out of that alone. A complex man, a complex poet, he keeps slipping the nets of our need to categorise, pigeonhole, or otherwise reduce them to a manageable sound bite. He will not be tamed, he will not be emasculated. There are many Michaels, each of us who have contributed to this anthology, who are gathered here in his name, who gather here in his name year after year. Each of us knew a different Michael. So appropriately, this book shines like a cut stone, diamond perhaps, many faceted, many Michaels stroll out of its pages. I met Michael myself in 1984, aptly enough, in Grogan's of South <laughs> William Street, also known as the Poet's Horror Hole. Um, I must have been introduced to him as an aspiring poet. He asked me had I any poems on me, and I had two poems in my pocket the way I once did carry them around. He told me the first one was no good. <laughs> Couldn't be a sonnet because it didn't rhyme. And that the second one was a bit better. Only a bit, mind. Uh, it was like having an audience with God himself. So much did I revere him. Back then I had the whole of the poem A Farewell to English by heart. And at that first meeting, I said it for him. As I said, since then, the memory has gone. Um, that, that poem was, a, was the start of a journey for Michael and for his devoted readers that would heal us back into the old language. I say farewell to English verse, to those I found in English nets, my Lorca holding out his arms to love the beauty of the bullets, and Pasternak, who outlived Stalin, but died because of lesser beasts. He was brilliant company, at once deeply erudite and very, very funny. And I learned so much from Michael, the naturalist, about the flora and fauna of Dublin, the names of the wild flowers in diverse tongues and their uses in the folk pharmacopoeia the names of the birds and the names of the creatures, their habits and habitats. Walking about Dublin, this was the recessionary Dublin of Inchicore Haiku, was the best of times. I saw the best of them then, the deep learning and the grace and generosity to transmit that learning. 
but there was darkness and danger there, a kind of glittering dance with his demons that terrified me and terrified me more as time went on. It was hard to be his friend. There was a lot of pain for those who loved him. The Irish suicide, slow and devastating. In the last few years of his life, Tony Curtis would bring me to visit him, and it was heartbreaking. I would not glamorise Michael the drinker. He would not glamorise himself. I remember one chaotic trip back from Swansea in Wales, which involved me dragging him, carrying him some of the time, and his luggage onto a bus, then onto a train, and finally onto the flight from London to Dublin. We were coming through passport control and I was thinking, thanks be to Jesus, I would soon be handing him over to that lovely patient Saint Angela Liston when he turned to me and said, I'd hate to be married to you, Paul. <laughs> to be his friend, to watch him, to watch him die, even in the moments of surreal hilarity. I remember another time we were neighbours, myself and Theo, my beloved, in Merrion Square, and himself and Angela uh, nearby in Dartman Square. And he rang me up early one morning, full of mystery, and it must have been about 11 o'clock, which was early for poets. And he said uh, he had to see me urgently about a very important matter. And would I meet him in Ryan's pub nearby on Bagot Street? And I was trying myself at the time to stay sober and st to stay out of the pubs. And, uh, but he said, no, no, it's a serious matter, life and death. So I headed around there and got a cup of tea and sat down and was thinking, oh God, I hope this doesn't go pear-shaped. And um, so after a while he came in and total astonishment, Paul and me, what are you doing in here? <laughs> uh, so I don't know, either he genuinely had no memory of asking to meet me or he was playing an elaborate and devious trick, I'm not sure to this day. He was very like the trickster in, I felt, in Native American stories, the raven perhaps, or the coyote. Certainly his imagination, the way he experienced the universe, felt like Aboriginal mind, as if he had just come in from walkabout in our own native dream time. The Aboriginal mind, I believe, is the extreme opposite of the institutionalised mind. Indeed, it is the enemy of the institutional mind. A way, it is a way of seeing the world in its elemental forms, a way of calling that world into being. I started by saying I'm here to honour the book and I honour its makers, I honour James Lawler who has edited I Live in Michael Hartnett with meticulous care. He is a devotee of Michael and a very, very fluent and able champion of the poems. He keeps the candle burning before the icon and brings a passionate conviction to his work. Michael would love him. This is, this is a labour of love and it requires a lot of skill and diplomacy. Editors of poetry anthologies have a lot in common with mice herders at crossroads, <laughs> but his dedication has paid off. And of course behind and beside James is a cohort of helpers who brought the project to fruition, this beautiful book. And, and not forgetting the funders and the sponsors of the enterprise and the elegant design and what really makes a poet happy, I think you'll agree, the, uh, the absolute perfect copy editing because there's nothing like a stray comma to drive the obsessional mind of the poet <laughs> mad. Um, so all trades, their gear and tackle and trim as Jared Manny Hopkins has it, there is no poet I do not love from Wyatt to Robert Browning to Father Hopkins in his crowded grave, though some write with bitterness in their hearts. It is the one art or many arts. 
So this crafty and handsome in design, it's a pleasure to handle. And this will be a treasure. This, this book now is on the record. It's there for eternity, really. And I think it will go through many, many editions. There will be more, but there'll never be one like this. So only um, the... I think he has herded, James, a great gang of mice, Michael's contemporaries for sure, but the generations after. And the entire community across the generations and across the genders, all 17 of them, are represented from sol solemnity to hilarity. Fly me to McCroom. <laughs> from, the, from the street to the academy. From the small green fields to the wounded streets of the city. A massive outpouring of love. There is no other word for it. There is a kind of cure in its loving nature, a sense of solidarity in the face of our shared mortality. Only the poems outlast us, and the book fixes forever the flux of the historical moment, the energies that constellated about Michael's death. Mm -hmm. Our sense of loss at the time and the series of aftershocks of loss since are recorded here. I am honoured and delighted to have been asked to launch the book and this festival under Joan McKernan's magnificent, generous, compassionate and wise stewardship over the years is a great tribute to Michael. I'm honoured to name the book and to end the book, book ending it with Ivan Boland's magisterial poem, Irish Poetry. <clears throat> and I thought I would read those two poems now uh, that hold the mass of the poems in their arms. Now, um, let's see. And we'll send it on its merry and its melancholy way. So this is Ivan Boland's poem, Irish Poetry. We always knew there was no Orpheus in Ireland, no music stored at the doors of hell, no God to make it, no wild beasts to weep and lie down to it. But I remember an evening when the sky was underworld dark at four, when ice had seized every part of the city and we sat talking, the air making a wreath for our cups of tea. And you began to speak of our own gods, our heartbroken pantheon. No attic light for them and no Herodotus, but thin rain and dogfish on the stop gap of the sharp cliffs they spent their winters on. And the pitch black Atlantic night and how the sound of a bird's wing in a lost language sounded. You made the noise for me, made it again, until I could see the flight of it. Suddenly, the silvery, lithe rivers of your southwest lay down in silence, and the savage acres no one could predict were all at ease, soothed, and quiet and listening to you as I was, as if to music, as if to peace. And I'll finish with the um, hagiography. I wanted to write something that maybe Michael would get a laugh out of. And I know he would have found this outpouring of poetry incredibly funny and I think ultimately transformative. I know when I was here, um, some years ago and heard the beautiful youth choir's renditions of his poems. I just thought, imagine if he had heard that with his own ears. Imagine what it might have done for him, you know, what it might have opened. So, hagiography. Just back from Aixha Michael Hartnett, you'd have to laugh, your corpse not even cold yet very aboriginal to be beneath a sign at the brand new estate address Michael Hartnett Close, Newcastle West. Its position is perfect, right opposite Cool Lane, stood there in the pouring rain with your son, 
across from the Healing Streams Therapy Centre, St. <laughs> Vincent de Paul, within earshot of the river on a quiet day. Get this, the story Joan McKernan told us of the poetry workshop for children earlier when she'd asked who'd heard of Michael Hartnett, the lad who cried, Miss, Miss, I live in Michael Hartnett. I recognised the mantra like a glittering speck of mica whirling down the bardos from another incarnation and the flash of recognition has it graven on my brain. All together now, I live in Michael Hartnett. I live in Michael Hartnett. I live in Michael Hartnett. Thank you. Way any trade secrets when I say that I, I think that was Joan's choice. The title of the book was Joan McKernan's choice. Having I wasn't involved in the process, so no one can blame me for anything. But <laughs> but um, I do know that well, not just Joan, but in talks with Dominic and James, obviously. But Joan was passionate about having that to take the title of the anthology from that, as I said earlier, because it epitomized her own ethos for Aisha, and also for what she saw that James was, was aiming for with this book, and I think obviously has achieved. Um, again, thank you all for being here. Thanks so much to Paula. Thanks to Dominic, uh, to James, obviously, to Revival Press. And what we want to do now for the next, uh, however long as a piece of string is, is celebrate the contents of the book. And in doing so, we will continue to celebrate Michael Hartnett, but we will also celebrate all the poets from all over Ireland who were moved to write, inspired by him and about him. So we can move down the street, someone who's better at directions, down to our right, across the bridge, to the right, and then on your left. Second, Cleary's bar we're going to. It's, they're Irish, it's a bar, they'll find it. Most of them are Irish, anyway. And in keep, Draper's bar in keeping with Beckham. Um, so again, thank you all for being here. The books are on sale, we have to say that. Uh, down here on, on my right, towards the end of the room. So have a look. Thank you to everyone who showed up this evening. And we will see you in a few minutes in a further rotation where we will have readings from the anthology. Thank you very much. or love in two half languages. One, a Hmong white sepulchre. A tribute to Michael Hart. Twenty thousand doors abruptly slammed in my face, cast out of my place. Being damned with faint praise, the blight of my twilight days. 
Death sees me reborn to suck with the poor, a ghostly diminutive form, my joy rekindled. Thank you. Well done, all the various things, it all so being so reflected so well. And of course in Gabriel's as well, Michael's, Michael was a formalist. Um, and that, that shows beautifully true in, in, in um, Gabriel's poem. And also in the one I read, which has that very complicated rhythm actually, of uh, Don Lushy Pons. Next I'd like to call please, and John Pimsmith. Uh, my poem is third from the last, and I actually share a double page spread with someone whose name kind of rings a bell. Uh, Seamus he Heaney? Uh, so he's, it's quite he's an not honor. Here. He's not. <laughs> but it, it's just lovely. The poem that I'm going to read uh, was born from a Michael Hartnett favorite poem of mine. How Goes the Night Boy, and the poem was framed from a quote from Macbeth. So I decided to do the same thing with my poem. After life's fitful fever, her honey hair, her eyes small ovals of fresh eggs, he willed to me his bitterness and thirst, his cold ability to close a door. In a stone-cold kitchen, she clenched her brittle hands around a world she could not understand. Better than a prize, festivals, or bronze, some poems live on in glorious company. He sleeps well. Thank you. Uh, just briefly to say that I was looking up to know Mike in the same class as his brother Gerald, and I was delighted Gerald was there the other night because he was away quite a lot. Um, and on Rodella Boalimara, if only knew the bullets to happen it in the 70s and 80s, we all just spoke Gaelic, and um, he actually meant what he said when he wrote a farewell to English, and he put a huge amount of work, and I think he isolated himself in a, a huge way. Uh, I just, you know, fantastic admiration for the man, because he could have just forged ahead with a career in the writing English. So, um, just a little boast, as well. I had this published in the local paper, the Weekly Observer, in 1999, at very close to the time he died. And uh, I know some of the things I've used that have been used, I've seen in other poems about Hapless, and uh, I suppose I'm kind of making the same for O'Rahila and O'Bruder, because, um, like I say, I, I wrote it within a few weeks, and within the local paper. Might and Hapless, Pina, Tasha Lana, Pina Kui, it's on page 25 for those that are about it. Near Thish, a staff lad, a codex of Cobbert Dorica, for Yen and Dive Shishan Thig, Gorgoy La Hawas Koyama, Gredonish and Bachman. Hecaid or Rahela or Bruder. A mot for Hollis and Tronona, Dora Margrojat, a Tregan or Goluder. Gomahabo doing Gregor Noit, Rustran Soil to Dominicana, is called the Dufla Foil. Horgwinner above Gulakati, Hukshansta Huilali, El Rebishti. Gurien the Lorgama, Dasht, is too be feel the kind. Hoglish Gokshala. All of the temporary settlements we come to have the loving feel of permanence, but too much. The smell of cinnamon and coriander, honey, pinned and mounted butterflies, unwearable golden shoes. When this act of all acts, it's supposed to be a rebel act. Break camp. In the morning, we have to move on anyway. Overnight, the weather has changed. Thank you. Carmel Commons is next up to you. Thank you. It's on page 96. 
that's an interesting um, Kisht of his fragra egg in the Kanga. Is Anish Mahak, Ted the Farhok, a Kaljeshi Gong Rawa Gong, the Heron Shakran, at his popular first suicide in nine to San Salon, Koshan Beta, the Pai Boba, the Shay of Kodain, at Nihi Anal Shak the Pai Gesh, at Nyask Kadra. Um, as time goes on, we're going to be in competition with the rugby if we're not already. So um, we need to speak up the poets of Ireland if we want to be heard. And this is our chance. And I see uh, Dominic Taylor from Revival Press has joined us and is recording here. And I'm sure that's a bag of books he has there in the, if anyone would like to buy another copy. Um, Paulo Colmohan, please. Thanks very much, Eileen. It's such a, an honour and a, a pleasure to be here. I feel like saying, uh, my name is Paul, and I live in Michael Harkness. <laughs> uh, I met Michael years and years ago when Marie, my wife and I were living on the great Blasket Island, and we used to wander into Tralee every now and again, and we used to run into him quite often and had great conversations over coffee. Um, so I, I always remember him very fondly. This is a poem called Epilogue. Like a wren he was, bright and quick and brown, head angled to miss no trick, hair like down, brushed, feathered around the black bird eyes. And what a sound we heard from that almost elusive wren poet, half hidden, giving full throat to all he saw or felt we missed, for any naturalist of song to hear. And he flits among the brambles of our thoughts, his song caught, hedged round, a sound that proves them wrong. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next, please, Terry Murray. Ah. I'm doing the sound effects, moving the chair. Thank you, Ivy. Yeah, it's fine. Um, like Michael, I go a long way back and into call my father's family. I uh, go back six generations, and uh, my maternal grandfather is also from into call um, in Wind Street near the Oblitz Church. So uh, Michael was speaking about St. Michael's Estate. So here's my poem: St. Michael's Estate. Hartnett knew the subtlety of it when he lived in Inchicore, watching the slums replace his tribal village, an old barracker. Subverters in pinstripe demolished show square, brick by brick, held together by archetypal memory. When it was Richmond Barracks, the men of the rising taken there, after a night spent in the open, the leader shot, the rank and file transported. The Landry's owners and gerrymanders learned their trade well. Divide and conquer, carve up the community, isolate the centres and stack them up in concrete boxes. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Mark Freeland down there. Where are you, Mark? Uh, this is a poem titled uh, Barn in memory of Michael Harkness. I met Michael uh, many, many years ago when he was working on, on the, on the Counterscot, uh, a book of collected poems, an anthology rather, of poems uh, based on Lyric Poets. And he wrote the introduction for it. And he read many times at our invitation in the uh, Joint Families upstairs. Barn. In memory of Michael Hartman. Hawk attentive between the rafters, you watched with a slow field gaze as the bell time evening fell, so fell the bell time evening falling on the dreaming otter falling 
in and out of languages falling, in and out of silences falling, under the hubcap on the gable becoming a stopped clock. Thank you. Um, usually us working class poets are always giving out about the middle class poets because there's far too many of them. But Michael, although he had working class origins, his work went beyond that, and his example makes us all equal. And the thing that strikes me about this anthology is that it's a wonderful democracy of working class and middle class poets all together. Actually, I dare say it's not democracy, it's a republic. <laughs> the true poet beckons forever. Your pony grazed the long acre of grass that reached no cross or finish. White thorn blossom was a thin money that you bruised with a pinch. Even when the wind was dry or the sun was alight, you had rain in your pockets, rain in your mind. In your coat of blackbirds, you were the tune in the hedge. When you were gone, gone, you were never dead. Your shoes of grass await in the grass for those who step where you stepped. I only know the man through his work, so hopefully home will show that as well. Heart knit a boo. Instinct, intelligence and wit drove your restless spirit. In truth, the man... Your rabbit was lovely. Not only as a memory of Hartnett, but of all our past ages, I think, as well, you know, so it's, it's lovely. And, and speaking of memories of past ages and future ages, we have, I think, a very loyal family of people um, who return again and again to Aiksha every year. Not only our local people here who all support it, um, and various people, but there's one face that I think I've, I've only ever missed one extra Michael Hartnett and, and every year I have seen another face there and that's Pauline Fane yes. who comes down from Dublin every year um, and I don't mean that as any, I'm, I know there are lots of other people so I'm just saying, saying that in the sense of the loyalty and the, and the joy that's, that's every year at Aiksha um, and so Pauline is our last uh, reader for this afternoon. So. You're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, like Gabriel, I missed the phone calls, and you reminded me that uh, at one stage I didn't realise that Michael had gained a nickname in our house until he was on the phone to me for about an hour. He was teaching me about opera and he was singing, and then he decided he was giving me a recipe for the dinner. Oh, yeah. And one of the kids kept opening the door, he was about four at the time, and he kept looking out at me, and then I heard him shouting back at the rest of them, you may forget asking or anything, the singing poet is on the phone again. <laughs> <laughs> well, so after that he was always known as the singing poet's on the phone for you now. You know? uh, so I wrote this poem here at H. Hartnett in 2003, because while I missed the conversations, I kind of fooled myself that when I go up to visit the grave, I can have a conversation, and I imagine the answers coming back to me, so. The visit. As visitors do, I thought to bring armfuls of flowers, or a single stem graceful with dew, searched each shop display for the perfect petaled gift, thought of culling wild woodbine from hedgerows, or the bright red berries winter birds feed on, but arrived with empty hands, took, instead of gave, a pebble from your grave. Thank you. I like that, I love that closing image of the idea because I think it just epitomizes the Aksha and this wonderful anthology. That, that idea of taking something, but not as in a theft as in a richness, as in a gift, really. Um, thank you all for being here. I think this is a wonderful book, and we're, we're going to be very proud of this, and the Revival Press are very proud of it. And again, 
I think thanks to all of you for showing up this afternoon in spite of rugby and all the other distractions. Ah. Um, that, uh, that's, um, well, we had one deserter, but we won't say a word about her. Um, yes, we have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of our committee, Helena, she told us. I hope she can hear me wherever she She went to the rugby. She went to the rugby. And not only that, but she came out at lunchtime in the jersey and she said, I'm done at five, right? And that's all. So that's okay too. There's, there's, we knocked a lot of work out for the last few days, so that's all right. She, she's more than made up for it. Um, just to thank you all again, the book is on sale and will be on sale for, for the next um, day or two. Uh, the wonderful Avril and Vicky O'Sullivan, who run the, the, the bookshop here, uh, just off the square up to your right, uh, they will have copies of it as well, so you'll be able to get it here after this. Um, thanks to all of you. A very, very special thank you to Cleary's Bar for hosting us this evening. Um, very nicely and thank you for all your cooperation um, the only thing else left for me to say is our next event is at 8 o'clock in the county council area offices where we'll hear the wonderful poet Tony Harrison and the equally wonderful composer and singer Julie Feeney so hope to see you all there and for those of you who still have energy left uh, after that, we'll be heading across the road to the Courtney Lodge Hotel um, for Club Nahegshire, where you can all relax, sing a song, say a poem, you know, whatever the mood takes you within reason, we'll allow. Um, and that will be emceed by Gabriel Fitzmaurice, in case he had forgotten. Uh, so, thanks a million. We'll see you all at 8 o'clock. Good evening.